Goodbye. All right. Well, then I officially call this April 25th, 2024 special meeting of the Long-Term Financial Policy and Audit Subcommittee to order at 4 o'clock p.m. Madam Host, may I have a roll call? Chair Rogers. Acting Chair of Staff. Here. Member McDonald. Here. Let the order reflect that all subcommittee members are present with the exception of Chair Rogers. Thank you, Madam Host. Would you now please explain how the public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Thank you. Welcome subcommittee members, panel members, and members of the public. Thank you for joining us today in person and via Zoom. This meeting is being recorded. As a reminder to all present, please set your cell phones so as not to disturb others. The City of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment, free from disruption, will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. We have made available hard copies of today's agenda located at the entrance. Please feel free to use one to follow along. After an agenda item has been presented, the chair will ask the subcommittee members for their comments or questions, and then immediately following their discussion, the chair will open the item for public comment. If you are attending in person and wish to comment, you will be called on when the agenda item is open for public comment. Please raise your hand to indicate that you would like to comment. Once you've been called upon, you will be asked if you wish to state your name for the record. Each public comment is limited to three minutes. And a courtesy timer will be set at the host table, which will sound at the end of three minutes with a series of beeps. If you do not have a comment, but would like to ask questions relevant to the jurisdiction of this subcommittee, there are forms located at the entrance of the conference room. Please complete the form and leave it in the basket. The staff liaison will address your questions appropriately prior to the next scheduled meeting. Our meeting format is integrated to allow members of the public who are using Zoom to view and listen to the meeting. Any email comments that were received by the deadline will have been included and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting, and emails are not read into the record. Perfect. All right, we'll move on to item two. Uh, we'll now take in-person public comments on item two non-agenda matters. This is the time when any person may address the subcommittee on matters not listed on the agenda, but, we, but which are within the subject matter of the jurisdiction. Do we have any public comments? From, from the audience, gentlemen. All right, then, we'll move on, we'll on to item three. Approval of minutes. Councilmember McDonald, any edits or corrections? No, and I recuse myself from these approval of minutes, so I have to go to the next meeting for approval. All right, well, I have, I think we can. Actually, I don't know. Can we do it with one? Or we just approve? actually, I think we do it to the next meeting because you have meeting. to have at Continue. least two people to approve them. All right. We'll wait until the next meeting then to approve these minutes. Move on to item 4.1, the quarterly budget review for the third quarter. Uh, Veronica, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, our quarterly budget review is our overview of the general fund budget for the year to date. We last met in January to talk about where we landed at December 31st, and here we are to catch up on where we landed as of March 31st. So our agenda for the day is we're going to look at our third quarter general fund revenues and expenditures. We'll move into our year-end projections for the year, where we think we're going to land, and then finally kind of take a five-year outlook and look back of where we think this year compares to the future and to past years. So if we can move on to the next couple slides, please. And one more. Thank you. So we show on this slide the year-to-date revenues for all of our major revenue categories. The first column shows our adopted budget. Um, that was 204.8 million. We had a couple minor changes throughout the year. So we're at 205.1 million. Year to date, we've collected 124 and a half million, about 60% total. So being in March, three quarters of the year, that's totally normal because a lot of these are have timing flags, which I'll kind of cover as we go down the list. Property taxes, we receive pretty much a even 55% in December and 45% in April. So this is just trending a little bit ahead of schedule, but right where we want it to be. Sales tax has been coming in low. When I last met with you in December, we were seeing it coming in low, even on a lag. Um, we would expect this 54% to be more at about 58% right now. And if we project out, we are projecting to come up short by several million. 
Um, I will note that year to year or month to month, I'm sorry, as we see our sales tax installments come in, they have been coming in consistently lower than last year. This wasn't expected. We had been hearing that sales tax was going to slow down. It wasn't necessarily going to drop, but it seems at this point it has dropped as compared to last year up until March. March was the first month that we finally saw the sales tax installment actually grow from March of 2023. So that could be an indication that things are kind of finally starting to pick up a bit. Um, I do want to mention that every economist out there and all the webinars that Alan and I attend, the message out there is that this is not a bad economy. It's not a, you know, a sense of a recession or anything going on with sales tax leveling off. It's just an indication of spending going more towards services, vacations, non-taxable goods. And we're seeing that as we get down to um, occupancy tax and our tourism revenue. But sales tax has been lower than we would like it to be this year. We are hoping to kind of see the, the drop level off and start to kind of get into a normal year over year growth. But we are just in that phase where we're coming out of the, the more aggressive growth of the pandemic. It's dropping a bit and then it's going to kind of balance out. So we're just seeing where that lands. Um, but that one is also received on a two month lag, as I said. So we wouldn't expect to see 75% yet, but we'll see how the year pans out. Utility users tax is another one that we receive more that's a little bit on a lag. So 75% isn't where we would expect to be. And this one's coming in strong. We project this to exceed budget due primarily to PG&E and energy use taxes being high. Um, other taxes, the next line down contains a lot of more big ticket items. We're gonna look at that on the next slide. Licenses and permits, these are our PED revenues. And these ones are just a bit low as well. Um, their permit volume has dropped off just a bit. It's not enough to be a concern. It's just more an indication of a lot of home improvement projects going on during the pandemic and a little bit less happening now. Charges for services is about on track. Um, I will, to be transparent here, we've had a bit of a um, server error going on over in Reckon Park. So we're missing two months of recreation revenues in this amount. So that would have been for April, I'm sorry, February and March which are not huge months for recreation anyway. So it's not making or breaking our number here, but the numbers are artificially a little bit low and we're expecting those to get back up into the system next month. So we're missing just a small amount of money, but we're right about on track with 73.5%. The remainder of those categories are all pretty small dollars, nothing that's going to make or break our general fund. The points I do want to note is that transfers in, we usually see 100% of that by the end of the year. This is resources coming from other funds that come into the general fund, primarily gas tax. We receive gas tax from the state and we are able to use a small amount of that for admin fees. So we transfer some in to cover the administration of gas tax. Same with um, our special assessment funds that are a fund separate from the general fund, but we transfer some in to cover administration of those. Um, our miscellaneous revenue is coming in low this year due to our fire contract overtime. When fire goes out and fights fires in other areas, we receive revenue for that. This year, fortunately, there have not been that many fires throughout California that our strike teams have been called out on. So we don't have that much revenue coming in, but there's an offset for that in expenditures. We're seeing a corresponding low expenditure line in their contract overtime. Um, and that's the main points on this slide. We could move to the next slide, please, for other taxes. This is a breakdown of the other taxes line on the previous slide. So there are some larger items in here that I would like to cover. So our VLF swap, that's our vehicle license fee swap. This is something we receive from the state and we get two installments of this 50% and 50%. So our next installment will come in in the next few months. And since we're already at 51.4% of budget, we're going to exceed this budget line item. Franchise fees is coming in high, primarily due to our disposal franchise fees, which have been very high, as well as um, we have franchise fees on energy costs as well. And so those come in higher in the second half of the year. So we expect, ex expect to succeed budget on this one. Motor vehicle license fees, this also comes from the state. It's small dollars. We get one installment. So 220,000 is what we're going to get for the whole year, exceeded budget by just a bit. Cannabis industry tax is one that in the last few years, we've really seen it kind of stabilize around 1.8 million. So we're on track to hit that about for this year as well. Business tax, we are almost at budget. We received most of this in February. So while a little bit more revenue will trickle in in the next few months, we expect to hit budget just right about 
clear where you think we'll be at 4.6 million. Real property transfer tax is one that every quarter we tell you that we're running low on this one. We continue to reduce our budget and the revenues continue to just drop off due to the high interest rate environment and the low volume of home sales in Sonoma County and Santa Rosa. And then finally, occupancy tax. We budgeted 6 million, we're at 4.9. We will likely exceed this by the end of the year. Um, this has been rebounding and we, so last year at fiscal year 22, 23, we collected 6.6 .6 million by the end of the year. We expect to get about somewhere around there, especially considering that um, the last quarter of the fiscal year is um, a little bit better for tourism. People start coming out more. And next slide, please. This is a comparison of these same major revenue categories compared to the third quarter of last year as compared to this year. So it's year to date. So not just the third quarter, but year to date last year as of year to date of fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 24. Um, we would hope to see growth in most of these revenue categories, but I'll kind of take you down the line on these. Property taxes up 7.6%, it's pretty good. Our three-year average and five-year average are both 5%. So to see 7% growth is better than expected. Sales tax, as I mentioned, is down. We have seen every month our sales tax coming in this fiscal year be less than last fiscal year. So to see a 5% reduction was not what we expected for the year, but the year is not over yet. We do start to see some growth, as I said, in March. So we might make some of that up in the next few months. Utility users tax is low as well. Um, this is just a timing thing. We haven't received as many installments in UUT year to date this year as we had last year. So we do expect to exceed last year's UUT by the time the fiscal year is over. And other taxes also is growing. This is mostly due to franchise fees, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Licenses and permits is down a bit. As I mentioned with PED, same thing. Their permits activity is trending downward. Not anything for us to be terribly nervous about at this point, but just less than we've seen in the past. And same with charges for services. That also includes some PED revenues in there, but that also part of that is the missing recreation revenue. It's not, not a lot of money. Maybe, I'd say maybe $100,000 of it total or less is from recreation. Um, and then finally, we have our smaller categories. Miscellaneous, that's a large percentage, 27.8%, but that's a very volatile category. We get one-time things in there that can spike certain years and have anomalies. So we tend not to put too much stock in that one as it can really fluctuate year to year. So overall, as compared to last year, we're down by 0.3%. Um, and that's mostly driven by sales tax. And next slide, please. So we've taken a stab at projecting where we think we're gonna end the year. Property taxes, we expect to exceed budget, which is good news. Um, we're expecting to exceed budget by about 1.4 million, which is going to help offset that sales tax line. Uh, missing the mark by $5 million is going to hurt because sales tax is our biggest revenue generator in the general fund. So we're watching this one closely for next year, but for the current year, it's, um, you know, we'll, we will, we're hoping for the last quarter, we're going to make up some of that loss, but we just can't be sure till we're there. UUT, as I mentioned, we're coming in strong. Other taxes, we're expecting to exceed budget mostly due to franchise fees and occupancy tax. And the growth in those categories is offset by the drop in RPTT, but all things considered, we're expecting that category to come out ahead. Licenses and permits, we don't think we're going to hit our budget mark by about 275,000. Charges for services, intergovernmental, and transfers in, we expect those to be right about on the mark, and we're expecting to come in just a little bit low in fines and forfeitures. That's due to mostly parking violation revenue. We've had a lot of free parking opportunity in the last fiscal year, so not as much violation revenue is coming in. And then in miscellaneous, as I mentioned, we're, expect we're coming in low due to strike team revenue coming in, but that has an expenditure offset. So overall, our final budget number was 205 million, and we're expecting to come in at about 202. So this is a revenue shortfall of about 2.8 million, which is unusual. We're usually actually used to seeing us coming in over budget and revenues. So that sales tax shortfall is really driving us down. So we're expecting to see a shortfall overall. 
And next slide, we're going to shift our conversation now to expenditures in the general fund. So we just covered revenues, what we're bringing in, and now we're going to look at what we are spending. So this is our total expenditures broken out by departments. Um, the first column or the second column budget, if you look down at the very bottom, 208 million, that was what we passed back in June of last year. Being March, I'd expect anything between 65 and 80% to be normal. Um, a lot of invoices are paid on a lag, so being right at 75% isn't really predictable, and sometimes due to vacancies, et cetera, things can vary. So some of the big anomalies I'll mention, the city council budget has been looking high. We mentioned this one last December, the interim city attorney budget was paid out of there. So they, there were some higher expenditures, which we will make a budget adjustment for. Um, city, let's see, in CIRO, Communications and Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Relations, they've had some vacancies, so their budget and spending has been pretty low. HCS, Housing and Community Services, they're only at 23% of budget. It's small dollars, but that's just a timing issue. Their invoices will all be paid by the end of the year, and they will expect to expend that. And non-departmental is another one that looks high. Um, that's an unusual one. That's due to we have a vacancy credit in there for um, vacancies of positions. And that one is kind of budgeted and it appears to be spent up front at the very beginning of the year. So at the very beginning of the year, they look to be overspent. But by the end of the year, once everybody else's expenditures even out, that one evens out as well. But overall, at 74 percent of expenditures, that's right in line with what we would expect to see at this time of year for the general fund. And next slide, please. So again, comparing department spending this time last year to this time in the current year, um, given growth of expenses, to me, what I would expect to see is anything between two to 7% higher in the current year as compared to last year. And we do have some anomalies as well. Um, city council's spending has been weighed down as compared to last year. That's because last year was an election year, so we had higher spending for that. Um, if I go down the list, human resources had additional, a new FTE added in the year, so their spending is higher in the current year. Um, housing and community services, that's just a timing issue of when invoices have been paid. We did do a reorg where we moved parks from TPW to the Rec and Parks Department, so that's going to skew our numbers for um, TPW as well as Recreation and Parks. So everything on here is pretty explainable. And when we look at the total line item with a growth of 8%, that's very expected considering growth in salaries and benefits and services and supplies year over year, costs continue to increase. And next slide, please. So I always make the point that when we're talking about expenditures in the general fund, we're primarily talking about salaries and benefits. Um, with an administra administration, fire, police, we are very people heavy in the general fund. It's not so much about capital expenditures or services and supplies. Most of what we spend here is salaries and benefits. Our biggest spenders are fire and police, which you can see from the pie chart. They have the most people, the highest costs for um, FTEs, followed by PED and then TPW which is a very large department. A lot of their spending is supported by outside funding, not just the general fund. So that's why they're kind of a smaller pie wedge here. Um, but we also have Rec and Parks, Finance, and you'll see the pie wedges get smaller. So year to date, we've expended 75.7% .7 of our salaries and benefits budget. That's not ahead of schedule. We have 26 pay periods in a fiscal year. So it's not an even two per month. So even though we're a ahead of that 75% mark, we're still actually expecting to get turned back and not fully hit our budget by the end of the year. And next slide are our projections of where we will hit the end of the year. Um, in salaries, we're expecting to come in under budget by about 480,000. And benefits, we're expecting to come in under budget of about 1.9 million. We always assume we will spend just about 100% of services and supplies. This is because departments make an effort to encumber, to spend, to get everything spent by the end of the year. Um, and then transfers out is something that is scheduled and predictable. These, these are general fund resources that don't occur. And spending does not occur in the general fund, but we transfer it to other funds for the spending to happen there. Um, examples would be we transfer funds out to the CIP fund for 
ADA projects, we transfer out to parking to cover their parking enforcement costs. We transfer out to um, the transit fund. We cover the free rides for veterans. And then this year, we also had a $2 million transfer out to the Bennett Valley Golf Course for their irrigation project. So these are things that we know are going to happen and the transfer will occur. So with the turn back from salaries and benefits, we do expect to come up under budget by about 2.4 million. So while we're not gonna hit our revenue mark fully on the head, we are no, we're not gonna expend everything on the expenditure side. And next slide, please. So putting everything together, these are our recurring revenues. This is the total of what we think we're going to hit by the year end, as well as our transfers in and our operating expenditures of what we just looked on on the previous slide of what we think we're going to spend by year end, we are looking at a deficit of about 3.375 million. So you may recall that last June, we passed a budget with a deficit of 3.3. Um, so, you know, if you can kind of visualize what our revenues are coming in lower than expected, but our spending is also lower than expected. So that 3.3 deficit is standing. The extra variance in there just has to do with budget changes and additional spending happening throughout the year. And next slide, please. So comparing where this year stands to previous years, this is a look at our general fund revenue and our general fund expenditures. Um, the graph on the left is revenue and the blue background shows our adopted budget and those orange columns is our actual expenditures. So the point here is that historically, we were actually bringing in more revenue than budgeted for many years. And this is the first year in a long time that we're seeing that flip. We're actually seeing our actuals be lower than what is budgeted. Again, I'm sounding like a broken record, but due to the sales tax, um, that's our biggest, biggest driver of the general fund. So when that one fluctuates, it affects everything. And in the second graph on the right, again, the blue is our adopted, and the orange is our actuals. And we, we have the point we're trying to make with this one is that back, especially in the COVID years, we were seeing a much larger gap, much larger turn back um, in 1920, 2021. But in recent years, we've really been narrowing that down better um, in terms of spending our expenditures. We aren't seeing as much turn back. We can't quite rely on that as much. And next slide. So this is a look back at our general fund surplus and deficit. Um, the line on the vertical column of the dash, that's your balanced budget line. So you can see consistently in the past years, blue represents what we adopted. We were adopting deficits back in 1920, 2021, and 21-22. Until 22-23, we finally adopted a balanced budget. We were consistently actually turning back a surplus so we can see that gap kind of start to close up. Um, we were obviously being a little too overly conservative in our budgeting and then coming out ahead in the actuals. And then in fiscal year 23, 24, we are not only budgeting a deficit, but we're also expecting to see a deficit. So this is definitely a change. Things are different in the general fund than they have been in many years. So we're all taking note and being a little, being far more alert to what's happening in the future. And then the final slide is our five-year outlook. Um, fiscal year 24-25 is our budget for the next year. This is still in progress. So at our budget study session in May, you're gonna see this table again, and it may be a little different. We're still nailing down our budget numbers. But right now on this slide, it shows 4.9 million. I actually think it's gonna be a little bit bigger by the time we get to May to present. The things we do want to note in this year is that we are transferring out in that transfer outline of 8.4 million, 500,000 of that is going to the Bennett Valley Golf Course. We are hoping that's not going to continue in future years, so we haven't budgeted that in the out years. Um, we also have a year where we have high expenditures for labor negotiations as well as elections, so we have taken those out in future years as well. Those would appear in the expenditure line item. So by the time you get to 25, 26, our deficit actually closes a little bit. It's not quite as large due to no subsidy to the Bennett Valley Golf Course, no elections, no labor negotiations. We're also hoping at that point, we'll be getting um, County Measure H revenue in, which will pay for our FIRES REDCOM contract, which is about 1.3 million. And that's a very large expense in the general fund. However, 
things then start to grow again in fiscal year 26, 27, 27, 28, 28, 29, as we start to feather in election years and labor negotiations. Um, and worth noting in this outlook, what we have not included are any COLAs as our labor negotiations are still in progress. We don't know what those will be yet. We also have not included any accounting for safe parking coming into the general fund once ARPA funds have been expended, um, any in response spending coming back into the general fund. We also don't account for the safer grant in fire expiring. This last year, they hired 12 firefighters that are grant funded, which we expect that grant to last about three years. And it was written that we cannot um, get rid of those positions when the grant's up. We have to absorb them. We may be able to absorb them through attrition. We don't have a plan quite yet, but we haven't accounted for that in here, um, a growth of 12 firefighter costs, because we're hoping there's going to be some way to mitigate that cost by the time that comes. So that's the conclusion of our third quarter update and where we expect to see the end of the year. And I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, Councilmember McDonald. Thank yeah. you. So I know in the past, Alan, we've talked about potential revenue increases. So we've talked about um, there's no tax currently on cell phone services. Have we explored that um, anymore as we're looking at the deficit in the out years? I have a couple of them that we had talked about in the past. I just thought maybe I'll list them all for you. You could just tell me. So it's the TOT, the cannabis tax, the cell phone tax. And, uh, and those are the three taxes that I recall that we, we talked about in the past. License. Business taxes. That's right. Thank you. So, um, yes, we did explore the, uh, uh, those, uh, we didn't explore the cannabis tax. We, what, let me, let me take a step back. What I looked at uh, and what we're continuing to look at are measures that we would need to go out to the voters for. Cannabis is not something that we would need to go to the voters. The council can increase that. Um, and that's something that we could discuss at any, at any point and, and move forward there. Um, the, so we did polling on uh, business tax, the UUT change, uh, that's where cell phone tax would be. It's mm -hmm. a utility user's tax and um, the business license tax. So TOT, business tax, UUT change. Um, what the, the two that pulled the best and frankly are the easier to explain and would return the most revenue are the TOT and the business tax. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that, and uh, um, we, uh, we will have meetings coming up uh, to, to kind of explore those a little more and then begin an outreach program before we uh, um, hopefully put it on the ballot. We would need to do that in uh, I think the last date that we have would be uh, a council at August 6th. I think the deadline to get anything on the ballot is August 9th, but we are planning for a July council meeting to with all of that information and to move forward there. Just a little feedback on that. That feels kind of late for a council to be talking about that when that would be a decision we have to make within weeks to, to get on the ballot. I just, I appreciate being really thoughtful about tax increases, but it doesn't feel like we're going to have quite enough time to actually get questions answered about it or change ballot language. If that is something we're going to go out with a couple of weeks later, I have concerns over the date of July. So, so the July date would be when we would finally wrap everything up and you would have your final your, your final ballot language that would go in. Okay. We we are not waiting until July to do we'll this. We'll be so, hearing it prior to that. Absolutely. Okay. All right. That that would have been a cons I mean, I I know I could be one of the tougher ones on stuff like that. So I just 
have concerns right. and plus potentially getting out to speak to the community yeah. about how this is going to work. Yes. Can you tell me why we decided not to do the cell phone increase when we're looking at this deficit? Yeah. Uh, so the cell phone in, or increase would um, would not return a lot of, and unfortunately, I don't have it right with me of exactly the the amount that would come in, but but because. Because of the cell phone industry and the way that that things are being bundled now, what used to be a when we first tried to do this in 2014, we expected uh, um, a a good return of revenue to come in, and unfortunately, we lost that 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 ballot measure. Um, since that time, the revenue that we would receive in extra is. Uh, um, has decreased quite a bit. So, um, and I can provide that information later. I apologize. I just don't have it on I'm top of my head. But at like some point- A million dollars or is it like- uh, I believe 000? less than a million is what we are looking at. I guess um, I, I'm concerned that we don't have enough revenue right. increases and that every million dollars at this point, when I'm looking at a $4.9 million- yeah. A million would help. It, it would help, but it, so understand what we would need to do. To get it to pass. Is to have a vigorous uh, um, uh, outreach and, um, and, and be able to uh, uh, really uh, um, put it in a way where voters would understand because in that case, they would be voting to tax themselves. Right. And, and those tend to not do well. Um, and the polling on that was, uh, was the lowest of all. Okay. So it was in the, I want to say the, the mid-50s, which still passes, but it- Is it 50 plus It, it would be 50 plus one. Yeah, okay. these are all general taxes. So, oh, so we don't have to get to a two third. No, no. Well, hopefully not. It depends on that one item that shall not be named that's coming in November okay. <laughs> that could rain on all of this. But we're going to hope that, that that doesn't go through. So what one of the things that we have to consider when we're looking at revenue items is a the the the, the ballot's going to be packed in November. Mm hmm. B, what is what can we get the the best bang the best return for uh, what we are going to put in to uh, um, uh, uh, to having the ballot uh, having the the item on the ballot the outreach that we would need to do up until that that last council date when we turn it over and all that so you're looking at. A, a, a much larger amount of money that would come in through the other two measures. Okay. And so it, it, it simply comes down to that. Okay. That's very, very helpful. On the turn back, how much was the turn back last year and what do you expect it to be this year? 2.4 million or does that offset our deficit when, it, when you say there's turn back money? The turn back, that's the phrase we use for unspent appropriations. Right. So we anticipate to be 2.4 million of unspent salary and benefits appropriations. And so that does help the deficit from the expenditure side. But the problem is that we are also coming up short in our revenues. So the deficit isn't really closing. So we expect. So we don't be, say the deficit's 3.9 million or 3.375. We don't subtract that 2.4 million from that because they're different buckets. Correct. Yeah. So this three, this this slide with the 3.375, this is the actual expenditures by the end of the year. This is not our budget, and then actuals would adjust that. So because when I do just the basic math, it looks like we're coming up about a million dollars short versus three point. Three seven five, but it makes more sense if you're like they're two different budget accounts. 
what I, I think I always wonder is when we turn back money, that money is usually appropriated to do other things towards the end of year that like projects or things that we don't, that we want to see. Is there a way that we could start to look at at the end of the year, instead of turning back, and, and I, I'm not saying we should absolutely do this, not do the projects. Can we offset the deficit from that too, if we're coming up short, so that when we're looking in the out years, it doesn't keep growing on itself. So if we if we backfill that by our turn back, it wouldn't grow as quickly. Yeah. Unless I'm doing I, the math wrong. I yeah, I think um, I think I understand where where you're going got subtracted that. away yeah the 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 problem is is that we we're now getting to the point where money turned back to us at the end of the year a or what what we would call a surplus or any anything that you want to call it is doesn't exist anymore getting that's what we're getting into so let me put it very bluntly um at the end of the year we project that we are going to have a negative situation, right? We're just negative. There's no money that we could put to anywhere else. We're going to take money out of our reserves to plug that gap. That is what's going to happen. And this, this is just where, where we've been trending to, and we've finally reached that, that spot. So that's sobering news. It should be. It still doesn't add up math to me. It still is. I've got a positive over here of 2.4 and a negative over here of 3.4. How come this doesn't offset this? So we passed a deficit. We did not pass a balanced budget. So when we passed a deficit of 3.3, even if we hit our revenues and even if we hit our expenditures, we still are in a negative situation. In this case, we aren't even hitting our revenues. So that exacerbates the deficit. But lucky enough, we're turning back a little bit of unspent appropriations. So it's bringing that deficit to still be about 3.3, 3.4. Okay. So you and, are yeah. taking the positive and offsetting Correct. the negative. So okay. we, yeah, that wasn't clear sorry. to me. So yeah, sorry if that's that. not clear. But yes, we are incorporating here the savings of the savings of any turn back of unspent appropriations as well as not hitting our revenue mark. And all in, we're still expecting to come up at about 3.375 in the whole. Okay. Well, I mean, it's sad, but you did a good job targeting the deficit and actually yeah. you're only $75,000 overage on that. So that's pretty hard to do when. And there's, about to, I mean, of course, know, this budget. thank you. But the caveat also is that without a doubt by year end, there's adjustments, there's last minute things that come through. So what the actual sure. deficit will be has yet to be seen, but from what are the information we have now, that's our best, our best guess of what we're seeing. And we can encourage people to get out and shop. Yeah. So I want to talk about that just for a second. I apologize, Mark. There's just one more thing. When we're looking at our sales tax, because those are the things that are, are down, even though utility tax is up. And so one could surmise everybody's PG&E bill is so freaking high right now. They're not out shopping for shoes because they can't afford them because they're paying for PG&E and lights to be kept on in their house. So I, I constantly hear We've got problems with people not shopping in the downtown. We've got problems with people not shopping because it's hard to park. So is there any conversation that we could see what we could do around parking and bringing that back when it comes to, I think we need to know the numbers, but they don't want to come down to the downtown to, to eat because they're, they don't want to deal with parking during the day or they don't want to come down and shop because they don't want to deal with parking during the day. So I, you know, I think you probably I, heard this a time or two, Alan. Oh yes, so I'm I, just... I have, and and so I, I will give you my most diplomatic answer with. Go this. for it. Since um, you're being recorded, we have uh, we have several. We have that parking structure right there, the one over on Fifth Street. Um, those two in itself sit largely empty all day long. That is eight bucks a day to park there. You cannot get a better bargain anywhere around. Go find a parking garage. I guarantee you it will cost more than $8 a day. We work, we work well with our police department to try to keep them as safe as possible. You'll hear me talk about this in, in May at the study session. 
we are we are working to try to uh, 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 use beautification projects on there to make them more inviting. The fact uh, that somebody is struggling to find parking, to be perfectly frank, I find that laughable because there is parking there. People, for whatever reason, choose not to go to the garages. I don't know how to help them at that point. Um, I will say that that we encourage shopping everywhere in the downtown and all around the city. Uh, the the where we are getting the bulk of our sales tax is not in the downtown. We receive about 11% of our and this is over years. This is 10 years worth of data. About 11% of our sales tax comes from the downtown what what what's identified in the, as the station, downtown station area. So we we've we've done that analysis. We know where it comes from, um, and so uh, we want our businesses to be successful. We want people to park here. We want uh, and, and we do everything we can to try to uh, um, make parking inviting. I, I just don't think that that is uh, that that's what's driving a five million dollar uh, shortfall in sales tax. No, I don't think it is a five million dollar shortfall, but I'm just wondering how much would have to be increased of, of sales tax to offset what we're getting in the parking. So if you pay like two bucks for parking, that's annoying because you have to get your credit card out and do it. And somebody goes into the store because it's easy for them to, and I spend seventy five dollars on a t shirt and then go have lunch. What did we make in sales tax? Because now I'm doing that, so it's not just supporting the businesses. What am I getting back on those sales tax? So I'd just like us to think about maybe outreaching not just to the downtown, but actually people in Santa Rosa who seem adverse to coming to the downtown area at times, whether it's it's concern over the unhoused, it's concern over parking. So we actually understand what's happening to offset some of that because 11% is still a, a pretty good chunk of money that comes into our budget, but could it go up to 15%? And then we don't have so many storefronts that are still open down there. I'm just, I, I'm trying to see what barriers maybe we have in place because of our current structure that could maybe be more inviting in the end. And I don't want to cut our, cut our nose off spider face. Well, the meters are there now, so we did it that way. If it's not working and we can make more money the other way, then well, we I I think if and so part of part of again, uh, you know, we'll talk about it in May, but part of what we're doing are uh, we we have a grant and uh, we're was able to hire a firm through that grant to do a, a very comprehensive parking study, even beyond what we've done before, that, that will look at things like, how can we be more creative in, uh, in parking? But I, I would say this, if, if we remove the meters in the downtown, what you would have are people parking where they are all day long. And, and so those meters and the way that we have that set up is to encourage folks to have the turnover, to bring more people into the shops to shop, all right? They're, they're, so it's, it's kind of, you're darned if you do, darned if you don't on, on that situation. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, we, there, there are a lot of things that we are looking through through economic development and all of that to try to boost our uh, our economy in Santa Rosa as a whole. Um, it, I just I'm I, I would just respectfully disagree that parking is the barrier to people wanting to shop. It may, it may be an individual barrier of somebody that doesn't want to walk a half a block. Um, that's, I, I mean, you go to Healdsburg, you're probably not going to park right in front of the restaurant you want to go to. You're probably going to either go to one of their uh, lots and walk a half a block over. But even Healdsburg has or, three hours free parking. 
They do. And then they tick it like crazy right after that. So, so they do revenue because they have three hours free parking because then they ticket people who forget the time and they're already shopping. Right. Their tab. And to, but to go in at any point and not to disparage Hillsburg at all, but I, I go up there and I know exactly where I need to park and it's not anywhere close to where we're going. It's just, it, it is what it is. And and if you want to go there bad enough and go to wherever you're going, that's just what you do. I So, I mean. I just think it's something when we're looking at a deficit, just like to look at everything we can do. And and, and we are. And okay. and so we, we absolutely are. Thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. It's always very enlightening to hear all of the different areas and how close you're on your target. It's always very impressive. So thank you for that. That's Anything else? I think so. <laughs> all right. Good, good questions. Uh, and I appreciate the parking question, not only because that our parking strategy is a legitimately interesting issue, but yeah. I like the fact that it got Alan on the bandstand, the soapbox. I hope the, P, I hope the PD picks up what being laughable, the concerns being laughable. Oh, <laughs> and I, I, I can't, yeah. yeah. It probably will. Uh, <laughs> Um, in, my, in my heart, I agree. And for the six people watching online, if we if we have six, um, I will say that I am happy with how busy our downtown is. There's been really a shift over the last, I don't know how many, how many last year in particular. Is it after six o'clock at night when you don't pay for parking? Um, you know, it's frankly, <laughs> whenever, I, whenever I come down, I'm surprised at how, how much business there is, weeknights. Um, so there's right. the momentum's heading in the right direction downtown. Uh, and hopefully that will eventually become clear in our, our sales tax figures. Um, as far as other questions, um, the presentation was depressing and clear. Thank you for walking through this. Um, clearly, we need more revenue. And we need to be super careful on the expense side. Um, the last, the uh, page 14 of the presentation, in particular, I like the way how you, I like the way that you're calling out potential future expenses in the the boxes at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, on, for future versions of this presentation, it would be helpful, I think, also to include some of the items you mentioned, like in response, like safe parking, like, like the firefighter commitment, to the extent that that makes sense, just as a, as a tickler for the back of our minds, mm -hmm. uh, because clearly we've got some big expenses potentially coming up. Um, and then, Alan, I'll, I'll underline the point that you made. Well, actually, Veronica, I think it was your point about um, the COLA, COLA and labor, labor cost adjustments. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's the the elephant in the room. Yeah. Um, just doing some very, very um, sort of rough math, as I as I like to do on the fly. Am I am I interpreting correctly that we're guaranteed, given us given estimates that we could make on future expenses and where the trend lines are going, that we're guaranteed to be in pretty deeply into our mandatory minimum reserves by twenty six twenty seven. At this rate, it's pretty likely we're, we're dipping into the mandatory minimums by 25, 26. We do have the fiscal stability reserves that okay. we will use first. And um, I believe there's 26, 20, million? 27 million and there's somewhere, yeah, somewhere in that ballpark. So after fiscal year 23, 24 ends, we will be taking somewhere around 3.4-ish million out of there. So that brings us down. And then next year, additional, will come from that as well. So once we expend down that 20 some million, depending on what our labor negotiations land on, that reserve could, yes, be spent by fiscal year 26, 27 at least. And then we will dip into our general fund reserves. We do have a surplus over the mandatory 17%. Um, so some of that will be spent down if that's not used for other things as well. So yes, we're, I wouldn't well, we're say walking, we will- we're I wouldn't walking a tightrope here. I wouldn't say we'd be getting into our 17% reserves by 26, 27, or 27, 28, but we are certainly trending in that direction. So. Okay, well, I'll stop with my back of the envelope math, but that's um, any any additional information or additional clarity in the future on, on when those minimum reserves start to come into play, that would be appreciated. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, and, and also to your point on the um, in response and... Uh, safe parking that that is something that we will uh we will want the council to weigh in on on, on in may 7th mm -hmm. in the study session so we have that particularly or we have that called out 
on a slide uh, to be able to call that question and uh, so that we can plan and do the do the planning work on there with those expense expenditures and going forward. Um, and I would just, you know, just to kind of put a bow on things is that while, you know, yes, we are looking at what we can find with revenue, um, you know, their expenditures are an issue as well. So we are getting to the point now, and this is what I was trying to say is that uh, before is that we're, we're kind of seeing that we are um, in areas where we traditionally had high vacancies, we're filling those up. Police is pretty much fully staffed. Fire is well staffed. Um, uh, um, we still have vacancy issues in other departments and we are trying to deal with that. And who knows, after uh, labor contracts, maybe that starts to um, help itself. But the, the idea that, that we need to keep in mind is that um, we, we have an expenditure amount that is uh, uh, that's already exceeding what we can get in revenue. And we're, we're starting to see that actually be more of an actual reality instead of a, a budget, me coming to you at budget adoption and saying, hey, you, you have more uh, expenditures than revenues of what we're planning. Now you're actually seeing it happen. So what we have to do is to be able to curtail our spending going forward. It's not just a matter of getting more revenue in there. You know, we, we need to be able to uh, somehow find the balance between uh, um, being able to uh, pay our, our employees uh, an amount for us to be competitive in the labor market. Um, but at the same time, uh, be able to be sustainable in the long term. And uh, uh, so finding uh, real solutions on the expenditure side, as well as on the revenue side, is what we need to be focused on and hyper focused on in this committee going forward, looking at it five plus years down the road, because that's your sustainability. We're going to go through some, some peaks and valleys right now, and, and unfortunately, some valleys right now. We've got some stability reserves to try to soften that blow, but we've got a very short window to be able to put in place stability plans that will last us to go out for, let's say, a five-year window. So that's where we want to put our focus. Understood. Message received. Thank you. Uh, let's go to public comment right now. Public comment for item uh, 4.1. Any, any members of the audience care to speak? All right, then. Let's move on to item 4.2, in-house services. Veronica, back to you. Yeah, Alan and I are going to do this one as together. Yes. So I'm going to turn it over to me, Alan. To yeah, let me first. kick this one off. Okay, kick this um, one off and then you'll hear from sorry me about in that. just a minute. I just realized my boss is in the corner there <laughs> and that I, I had a <laughs> small, yeah, just a small heart yeah. attack. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so in-house, so we have, uh, what we're going to walk you through here is at a high level um, what we are what we're looking at. We've heard from the council. We've heard from our labor groups. Frankly, uh, our departments that hey, there can be some uh, um, programs that we do that we currently use contractors for that we may be able to do uh, um, more cost effectively in house. Uh, the challenge that we've had in the past is, is how, how do we do that, that cost analysis? So um, 
uh, going into this budget cycle, we've, we've developed this, and this is something that Veronica is going to walk through in a second. But basically, we're, we have, uh, there, there were three main items that, uh, that or services that came up. Uh, one was janitorial. Uh, one had to do with uh, landscape maintenance. And one had to do with uh, just uh, some general construction. So, you know, we, we get these proposals from, uh, from the departments. Uh, they gather information, provide it to us. We do an analysis based off of that. There's usually, we go back and forth. And, uh, and if we can agree on what the long-term impact is gonna be, whether it's a, a, a savings or not, then, then it goes to, uh, we'll look at it at the city manager level and then ultimately it goes to council as, as we would put things through. So uh, um, what we're not gonna talk about here are the, the analyses of each of those areas. Uh, we're still doing it. So we're, we're, not a, we're not prepared to go into great detail there, but we wanted to at least let you know from an internal sausage making, if you will, uh, standpoint of how we are going about that analysis, how we are trying to make it as apples to apples as possible. And so that whatever the, either the costs that are gonna hit the, uh, the budget is what we can uh, uh, reliably expect to actually be a budgeted cost. So part of the template that, that, that Veronica and her team has worked on uh, that we've gone over with, with departments, um, that's what we're using. She's going to walk through that. I'm going to stop talking and let her go through some fun stuff. So yeah, there you go. All right. So yeah, as Alan mentioned, my team and I put together a template that we can kick out to departments when they start to voice their interest in putting a proposal forth. And this just helps us to gather information. So we funneled this through my team, three or four accountants, and we've all put our heads together of what we're missing and what makes sense to us. And in the top orange box there that says budgeted contracts, this is the very first thing we ask for. What contract are we eliminating from the budget? Because believe it or not, sometimes there is no contract and there is actually no expense to eliminate. Partners thinks of things differently than we do. And they say, oh, we're not really taking anything out of the budget. We're just adding a service. And that's not what this is about. We're trying to find ways to make things more cost effective. So we want to know everything about the contract. Where is it located in our system? When does it expire? Does it have any year over year um, cost increases built in? What's the annual cost? What's it for? So we go and we vet that when they tell us, we look it up to make sure that what they see is what we see and everybody agrees. The next thing we ask in green is the estimated costs and first and foremost, FTEs, full-time equivalents. And we ask what positions do you need for this? They tell us, and we have in the little gray box that says budget team only on the side. We do not want anybody entering their own salaries and benefits because that's the biggest cost by far. It's highly sensitive, and we want to make sure that those numbers come from me and my team. We run them from our system. We make sure no one's just doing estimates because that's really where the big variances happen if somebody's <clears throat> estimating those wrong. So we ask questions such as who's supervising these positions? Do you need a supervisor? We wanna be sure we don't have a proposal that we put in place that two years down the road, someone says, oh, this is too much for us to manage. We need to add another person now. Um, we want to know what the positions are, how many, their title, where they will be located. Do we need to open a new program for this? Will it be in an existing program? We go through all those questions and we estimate the salaries and benefits. Um, next slide, please. And then we go into the services and supplies piece and departments will ask them, you know, we will ask what kind of support costs will you need for this operation? And we try to get down to the very detailed level with them in terms of what's your telephone cost going to be? What equipment are you buying? What's the replacement on that equipment? How much gas for that equipment? 
What's the maintenance costs on your equipment? Do you need to buy this every five years, every two years? Do you need uniforms? Do you need small tools? Do you need anything else associated with this? Um, because every little bit adds up. So we add this all in. We have them fill out what fund, what key, where, where in our system will it be located? We estimate our year one costs. We ask, will these costs be growing year over year? Do we have control over that? Is it something that we can hold a supplies cost of $5,000 every year? Or is it something like gas that we know is going to increase and we don't have control over that and it's going to increase? And we take all our totals on the far right-hand side. And if our template is working correctly, down on that very bottom line, it will say total net savings or cost. And that will kind of give us a bottom line number. So as Alan mentioned, this is a back and forth process with the departments. It's a lot of, they give us information, we vet it, we check it, then we come back with more questions. And then that helps them think of more things that they tell us. So it's, it's a whole process that we go through. And next slide, please. The final step is we have a short little questionnaire for departments to answer for us. It kind of gets them thinking and gets us thinking a bit more if we've missed anything big. One question, will bringing services in-house have any legal ramifications or require opinion or input from the city attorney's office? That's a big one that sometimes we don't think about. And it also can require a lot of lead time if we do need the city attorney's input. Um, what date is proposed for the start of services in-house? This one is also can have a big effect because oftentimes, even in best case scenario, if it looks like it's going to be a great money saver, they're going to need six to nine months to bring people in, onboard them, train, get the equipment purchased. There's a huge lead time these days on buying vehicles and equipment. So there's going to be an overlap then of when our expenses for in-house services occur and the current contract is still going on. So timing is a big thing. And so even if we're seeing a big cost in the first year, it might still make sense to go through with it if it's gonna be savings in years two, year three, year four. Um, will any lead time or training be required prior to services being executed? That helps us figure out that timing piece a little better. Are there any risks associated with bringing services in house? This is something we consider because we pay a very large bill for liability insurance every year. We're wondering how this might play into something. Um, are there dangerous working conditions, professional training that may be difficult to curate and recruit, et cetera? For example, a question that came up with the janitorial services was, will it be difficult to recruit people for that position that will need to get clearance to access the public safety buildings? Things like that, that may provide a hindrance to hiring or to recruiting. We try to think these things through. And then finally, any additional information regarding the existing contract or proposed services that should be included or discussed. This is us submitting more finance. We don't think of everything. We think of things from a certain financial perspective. What else is out there? We just try to get the departments to kind of converse with us about other things they're thinking of. So we run that through our funnel to see is that going to have any cost implications down the road. So as Alan mentioned, we're still in the analysis phase with a lot of these and we do look at it from a short-term and long-term benefit perspective. Some of these may look to have a cost up front, but in the out years makes sense. And some are the opposite. In the first couple of years, it looks like it's saving us a lot of money, but then all of a sudden in years two, three, four, um, not so much. So we're doing our best to be as thorough as we can and really give these a, um, a good look because some seem to be great opportunities. So trying to catch everything that we can. And any questions? Want to go first? You want me to go? No, first? kick it off. All right. First of all, I'm very excited to see this sheet actually exists. This is something I've talked to city manager about. It bringing our services back in house as much as possible to where we are looking at pre recession 2008 to actually build our teams again. So I appreciate that we're doing a thorough analysis, especially looking at the deficit and the budget. But I, a couple questions you actually answered that I had ahead of time. And one was around the process of how is this actually done? Who fills out the form and then who gets it after that before it gets to city manager so that we're sure that there's that thoughtful process happening. So can you just walk me through that first? Sure. So what will happen is if we get word that a department is looking to come up with an idea to bring something in house, the first thing we do is we send them this Excel spreadsheet and we say, please fill this out and they'll fill it out and send it back to us. 
And my team and I, then we look at it and we start asking questions and we start saying, okay, it looks like you missed this line item. This doesn't, you know, we, when we look it up in the system, this is a little different. We start to vet those numbers. We fill out the salaries and benefits. We talk through it a bit more. And when we finally get to a place where we think that from our perspective, the spreadsheet is as complete as it's going to get and everything looks right, we are sure to send that to the department so they can verify. And we say, are you in agreement with this? A lot of the times it looks dramatically different from when we first get it but they're aware of why, you know, we know what's been added, what's been taken out. And so when everybody's on the same page at that point, it goes to the city manager and it's the city manager's determination ultimately. And of course, there's many more questions that come up then to not just the dollars, but other implications that may come up. So that's great. I'm happy to hear that it's like directly from whomever is mm -hmm. the subject matter expert, oh, basically, sure. of the department that's filling out the form mm -hmm. and going straight to finance and then back and forth before. So you get that final product with the long term impacts, mm -hmm. all the things that you probably where it said finance on that sheet mm -hmm. fill out for for um, it to, before it comes to city manager. So that was some of it was who actually fills out these forms. How does it go through the process? Just because I'm excited to see it done, you know, as, as far as that goes, let me make sure that really answered a lot of the questions that I had mostly. So I'm sure that we're, we're having the right people look at the form for budgetary reasons. Um, so uh, let's see, where are we at? You said that the forms, some forms had already come back in these three departments that you mentioned already, I'm assuming. Um, where is that at? And are we going to see this for budget hearings as a potential decision that could come before council? Uh, well, let me, let me give it a <laughs> shot and, and I will, we'll see how well I do. <laughs> so, I, I do think that, um, uh, so for some, we're, we're a little bit more further along in our analysis than, than others. So, uh, um, but there are some lags in impl implementation and that's what we're trying to figure out is, is where the implementation, uh, uh, how it could happen. So for, um, Definitely when we discuss this kind of at a high level, uh, very similar to this discussion is what we would have uh, on in the budget study session. Um, I don't know that, that by adoption that we would uh, be prepared to have any of these services in either because existing contracts, it, it, you know, are already in place. There needs to be a ramp up of, of staffing or equipment that goes into it. So what we may, what I would expect to see is at a point after budget adoption that we would bring an item to council and walk through uh, what the savings would be, how that implementation plan would work and when it would go through from that standpoint. And I just think that when it, when I'm looking at cost savings, that is obviously going to be very important to us most of all. Yeah. But even if we were flat budgeting and we could bring services in-house, it was seen that the scope of services would still be expanded. So take janitorial, for example, right? You have people that come in in the evening times, take care of our bathrooms and our facilities, our hundred and what, 17 buildings, 18 buildings that we own. So they have a very specific job, but we outsource that right now, I'm assuming based upon the yeah. slide. And so if they can't come in, we have to then contact the company, hey, this didn't get taken care of. Where if it's in-house and we actually find out that somebody didn't go to something, we just contact the person responsible for janitorial is taken care of right away. Yeah. So it feels like our customer service, whether it's even our own buildings or some of the other things we have, we have an increase of that service, which is very noticeable to the people working in the buildings or the community, if you're looking at some of these other services. Yes, so for I, me, that makes more sense to bring them in-house just for the simple fact of they're our own people. And, and those are the things that we weigh. Obviously, there's there are true hard costs, and then there are 
kind of soft costs yeah. what you're talking about. Sure, certainly if we have in-house folks doing a particular service, there's a direct line of accountability. I mean, there's somebody that I could actually call right. and say, Doug, how come this didn't happen? And then Doug's got an answer to me. And right now I would have to go through, you know, five different layers yeah. of whatever to, to and it, it's not going to happen. So those are, those are all things that are considered in part of the proposal that, that would come over and that did come over for that particular service. I, I think that that's, I mean, we're looking at the dollars and cents in this particular meeting, but I think that there is something to be said. It's the only thing that I kind of can see missing from the form is those soft gains. Go ahead, yeah, or so I can't I'll, call on you. Sorry, Markeisha. No, 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 no. I will say, um, of course, the dollar is one of the things that we look at the bottom line. But you're talking about employee retention and how do you expand additional services when you have additional employees. You're talking about a higher level of ownership that right. comes when you bring the work in-house, right? And there's a sense of empowerment when you give employees the work to do. Uh, you know, I know we have the landscaping contract and our own employees will say we can do that better. Right. And we know that's true because we see the work that they do. Right. Um, what happens when work gets outsourced, it is cheaper initially, right? It's always initially cheaper when you do a contract and then two to three years later, you got <clears throat> escalators, 5%, 10%. So it's something that we need to account for. But I think now that we've created this spreadsheet and this mm -hmm. plan, and the work is coming straight from the employees. You know, we had a joke earlier in my office. If you ask me how to put out flat fire, I'm going to send the lawnmower, right? So we definitely want to make certain the employees who are doing the work have an opportunity to provide the information. Uh, for instance, when the janitorial contract came to me, I asked very specific questions that they probably didn't think about. So it's like, okay, well, Maybe we're ready, but we're not ready. And it gives the staff an opportunity to go back and vet the additional questions and gives us an implementation time to yeah. say, all right, let's just do it right now because we want to do it. We want it to be sustainable. So we want to make certain that we're implementing properly. And I really appreciate that. The thing I want to make sure is that council has that opportunity to say, yeah, we want to pull the trigger on this, even though it might not be for another year because of scaling up. So just so that we understand that process too and have the information come forward, because I I mean, I know I would be in support of, of bringing as many services in house that we can for the very fact that we've seen contracts really go up um, for services and it's a very narrow scope in a contract. So like we're only getting just that much where if there are our own folks and we have something else that becomes a priority for the community and a priority for staff, then that's the opportunity to say, we actually have people to help do this work. And that, that to me is, is exciting to hear, but I really appreciate the form, the thoughtfulness that went into the form and that we're helping um, our own folks do the exercise so that they have that understanding as well. And so I'm excited to see it come forward. I'd like it to be brought forward by budget adoption, Alan. So do your best on that because I, I do think that this is in the times that we do have deficits to know that we've done the analysis. I think that really speaks highly to finance to be able to say, we're looking literally at every penny right now with our people to see what we can do. I can so they, just you, thank you so much. The items that we are looking at, they are a yes. We're just waiting on how do we implement and what is the, the time frame? Yeah, like. yeah. All right. Yeah. That's exciting. Thank you. All right. The only point I'll add to that is just to repeat what I've heard the city manager talk about in, in, um, in previous discussions about the need to keep um, high levels or particular areas of expertise in the city. So I'm glad for the focus on when, when we insource again or before we outsource, looking to make sure we've got mentoring programs in place um, or, to, or to create those, we keep, we keep certain, certain important knowledge bases here. I'm glad, I'm glad that's a point of emphasis. Um, otherwise, nothing else from me. Thank you for, for a good discussion. Uh, we'll move on to, I think it's item, oh, actually public, uh, public comments, sorry. Any, any comments for our, from the public, item 4.2? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, Item five, future agenda items. Council member, anything from you? 
I'm probably just so parking when I want to know. I want to understand better if we're if we're cutting our nose off to spite our face in the downtown. If more people, if we could consider doing a pilot and we would potentially have more people there if we had either even an hour or two free parking. That would be my my uh, goal is just to try it out and see how it would work. But I'd want to know the fiscal implications of that. It would be. <laughs> you don't have to agree with me on it, Alan. I just want to know the information. We will just let that one. Uh, <laughs> um, I do think uh, that the that the May um, hearing or the May excuse me the May meeting that it's regularly scheduled for May 9th, Given that we have budget study session on the seventh and eighth, that we cancel that meeting. Um, Perfect. You stole my line. We're officially canceling the Thursday, May 9th, 2024 meeting at 3.30. So the next uh, the next regular meeting schedule will be held on June 13th, 2024, at 3.30 p.m. Here. Please. I have an item that I think we probably can add to the agenda. Please. Uh, so we continue to talk about what events the city wants to sponsor throughout the year. And we continue to receive requests probably at the last minute, even items that are outside the community promotions. So I would like for us from a budgetary perspective, talk about what are going to be the city's main three events that we're going to sponsor for the year. Is it going to be the Rose Parade? Is it going to be Cinco de Mayo? Is it going to be because I because they all have budgetary impl impl implications, right? So and what I don't, we do have the community promotions and we'll keep community promotions. But, um, you know, you have um, uh, Wednesday night market. So. I think it's helpful if we have a discussion on does the city want to sponsor events and what events do we want those to be for the year? Agreed. That's a good one. Thank yeah. you, Madam City Manager. We'll that's add that to a, we'll add that to a future agenda. Any yeah. other any other items to add? No, that's a good one to add. All right, then let's adjourn. Um, so I'll officially adjourn this meeting of the Long Term Financial Policy and Audit Subcommittee at five five sixteen. Uh, thank you very much. Thank I'm done. You.